Luke 7, starting in verse 36 in, in a minute. Jesus was at a banquet, and he had his run-in with a very sinful woman. And at the conclusion of their run-in, he told this woman that he had forgiven her of her sins. And the people around at the banquet that were present and kind of watching everything that was going on, their response was, uh, was much like ours would have been, said, who is this that, that has the authority to forgive sins? They asked that question that was asked numerous times throughout the Gospels, who is this? And it's a question that's been debated for the past 2,000 years and a question that, that people still ask today, who is Jesus? Well, as Christians, we came this morning because we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We believe that He is our Savior. We believe that, that we can come and we can worship Him and edify Him and, and build one another up in Him and, and as a part of His church. But over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at this question, who is this, and, and several examples of the answer that we're given in the, in the Scripture for, for how, uh, how God goes about answering that question. Before we get into our text this morning and looking at Jesus' uh, story here, I want to share something that happened with you in, in, in my life personally a few Oh, it's probably been a couple years ago now. Uh, I shared this one Wednesday night, um, but I, I want to I share it with all of you this morning. If, if anybody in Gold Point breaks down, they typically do it at the corner of our house on 903 and the Vanderford Road. And I don't really know why this is, but if anybody runs out of gas, has a flat tire, needs air, needs oil, needs water, anything like that, it happens right there. Uh, I, it was funny, I knew I was preaching this message this week, and, and one of my buddies, he, he ran out of gas right in front of our house, and was, we were getting him some gas, I couldn't help but laughing about it. Well, a couple years ago, I came home, and uh, I was coming up the hill there, and I saw a car sitting there in the yard, and I didn't recognize the car when I pulled in. Uh, there were two ladies in it, one of them was a younger lady, uh, and then the other one was, I thought, an older lady probably, uh, probably the younger lady's mother. It ended up not being the case. And uh, Fran was walking, she was walking out the steps. She was actually on her way to a ladies' meeting. And she walked over to the car. Before I got out of the truck, I could tell that she knew, she had, she knew this younger lady. And they had some car problems. Well, Fran was on her way to the ladies' meeting. She was already running a little bit late. And she knew, you know, she knew uh, the ladies. And, and she looked at me and kind of gave me the nod and said, you know, you'll be all right. To, you'll be all right to uh, take them on. Now, I got a rule in, in life. And, and I, I just kind of go by this rule that I don't ever want to be uh, anywhere in a house or a building or, or alone in a car with, with a member of the opposite sex that I ain't married to. And, uh, or they didn't give birth to me. I throw my mom in there, too. But, you know, that's just a pretty good rule in life to protect your reputation. And, uh, but Fran, she looked at me, and there was a couple of ladies there, you know, the younger one and then the, the one I thought was the mama. And she, you know, she said, hey, it'd be all right. So I, I got them, and I didn't know where they lived. I'd never met them before. And the younger lady was kind of telling me where, where she lives. So she's telling me how to get there. And uh, I'm starting a conversation. They were nice. We were having a good conversation. We got there. And when we pulled up in the yard, I looked, and there's some kids in the yard. Well, I recognized the kids because at the time, my girls were going to school with some of the kids in the yard. So I hopped out of the truck. I went over, and I was talking to the kids for a little bit. And uh, I noticed the young lady, she got out, and, you know, she went on about her business. And got time for me to leave. I went to my truck, told them goodbye, hopped in my truck, threw it in reverse. And you know how you kind of throw your arm and then look back when, when you're backing up? I did. Oh, hold on. The older lady was still sitting in my truck. <laughs> now, I was, it was kind of, it kind of shocked me. And I said, uh, <clears throat> I said, ma'am, um, I, I got to leave now. <laughs> and she said, oh, well, I don't live here. And I, I did not want to be rude, but, you know, I got this rule that I mentioned. I don't go riding around with ladies that I don't know. But what was I supposed to do? She was already she was sitting right there in the back seat of my truck. And, uh, and, and I said, well, where do you live? And she said, I just live a couple miles down the road. I said, ah. All right. I mean, she was a little bit older and, you know, I, I figured if, I, if I'm going to break my rule this time is what it looks like it's going to happen. I said, all right, well, just tell me where you live. 
Well, instead of telling me where she lived, she did that thing like turn right here, turn left here, go a little bit up here further and, and, and take this next road. So we're going and I have no idea where I'm going to. And uh, I don't really go this particular road a, a lot because it just doesn't take me anywhere that I'm typically going. But she's giving me this right and left and all this stuff. And we're having a good conversation. I've invited her to church and I'm mean, just real uh, polite and everything. We're having us a good conversation. And then we get down and she says, says, uh, take a right at this, this next road. And this particular road that she told me to take a, a right on, I, I, I got to admit, I started to chuckle a little bit because I had a history of taking somebody to a house on this road. Uh, let, let me back up a minute. I pick up hitchhikers. And I know, like, on the way out the door, most all you ladies are going to tell me that's dangerous and I shouldn't do it. Fran feels the same way. We've reached an agreement with that in, in our marriage. Uh, I keep pitch, picking up hitchhikers, and she just doesn't ask me about it. And, uh, and, and what we'll do is she watches the news on WITN, and if I'm ever up there murdered, she probably knows what happened. But I pick up hitchhikers, and I picked up this guy hitchhiking one day, and I'd actually picked him up a couple times, and he, he always had me take him home home on this this particular road so I dropped him off at his house a couple of times and then I don't know how but he found out where I live and he just started coming up to the house and he would always ask for a ride home and I'd, I'd give him a ride home well then one day he was passing by and he wasn't even like stopping in the yard like he normally would and and I threw up my hand and I hollered at him. He come on over there and we got to talk. And I said, man, you need to ride home. And then it was like I became a Catholic priest and he was sitting there talking to me, making confessional or something other. He said, man, I got to tell you something. He said, I'm ashamed, but uh, that ain't really my home. I said, oh, I said, well, oh, okay. He said, I, I don't live there at all. I said, all right. I said, well, all right. He, he can continue to tell me that this was, this was uh, the house that he would go to to visit a prostitute. I said, oh, hold on, hold on, okay, now, that's, that's interesting. I said, so what you're telling me is you've been making me give you a ride to see your prostitute. He said, yeah, yeah, that's been what's going on. Well, I talked to him about that a little bit, and anyway, I, we'll get... We're we done with him. All right. So uh, <laughs> we're going back to this lady that's told me to turn down this particular road. I just chuckled because this said, I don't go down this road very often, but here, you know, and at this particular road, like most of the houses are right up there near the front of it. And then you go like another mile or so down the road and there's a couple houses at the end and, and the prostitute lived down there at the end. And, uh, and, and so I'm going real slow up there at the front. No, and she's going to tell me to stop at one of these houses. And I said, so you live right in, right in here real, real close? And she said, no. And uh, <laughs> it was at that point that I realized that, you know, this rule that I have in life, these rules are put in place for, for a reason. And I'm starting to realize not only have I broken my rule, but I've probably... I probably broke in my room with a prostitute. And, uh, and uh, I'm sitting there trying to like evaluate the situation. And at the same time, I'm praying. And when I'm saying I'm praying, I don't think I've ever prayed harder for anything in my life. Lord, please do not, do not let this be what I think it is. Now, look. If it's a prostitute, I still want to come to church. You know, I, I, I'm still going to buy a church and all this stuff and, and everything. It's just that I don't necessarily want to be riding alone in a truck with her or anything like that. And I'm just thinking about all the rumors that are going to get started if this is the case. Oh, I saw Chris. Guess whose house he was stopping at? Mm-hmm. Uh, preacher up there at Gold Point, guess who hopped out of his truck? Mm-hmm. And I'm just thinking about all these rumors, and I'm dead in the water because, yep, that was me. That was me that stopped there, and that's who got out. Well, sure enough, we go down the road, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, Lord, let it be the other house that's down here. And God did not answer my prayers. She told me which house to stop at. I said, yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. I, I let her out. She thanked me for the ride. Very polite. She went on about her business. She shut the door. Let, let me tell you something. I got 390,000 miles on my truck. I don't hit the gas pedal very hard very often because I'm afraid it might give up the ghost in some mechanical way that I'm not aware of. 
I let my right foot give that thing everything it would hold. And at the same time, I picked up my cell phone because I understood that we live in a small community and some of y'all like to gossip. <laughs> and I wanted my wife to hear it from my lips where I had been and what I had done before any of you gossipers had got to tell her about it. So I called Fran. But here she's sitting at church with all the godly ladies in the ladies meeting and she didn't answer her phone. I called her right back. Everybody's got the same thing. If you call somebody twice, it means what? I really need to talk to you. I called her twice. She, she didn't answer. I'm dialing her a third time. And by this point, I'm not worried about going home. I'm going to bust up in the middle of the ladies meeting and say, you know, I, I got to talk to you for a minute. She answers the phone on the third time. And in what has just taken me three minutes probably to tell you, I told her the whole thing in three seconds. I was, I was scared, I was panicking, and I was just, whew, there, there it all is. And I heard the scariest sound that a man can possibly hear from his wife on the other end of that line. I heard dead silence. Guys, you ever been in a discussion with your wife and she gets quiet? Ever been in a little argument with your wife and she gets real quiet? Imagine telling her you've been riding around with a prostitute. And then she gets quiet. I was scared. And then I heard the most glorious sound that I have ever heard in all of my life. I, I can't recreate it exactly, but it's somewhere along this sound. Good. Now... <laughs> if you know Fran well, you know what that is. For those of you that don't, Fran, when she laughs, does not make any sound. She goes, now over the phone, you can't tell You know, most people, they're laughing like y'all are, ha, 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 he, 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 ho. Fran goes, but if she's laughing really hard, she's got to breathe, so she'll go, ha. And I recognized that sound. And when I heard that she thought this whole thing was funny and she wasn't like going to, you know, kill me, divorce me, bury me somewhere and all this stuff. It was just such a relief to know that. Now, I will be honest. I did not find the humor in it at the moment. A few days later, yeah, I started to see yeah, that, that, that was kind of funny. But what was going through my mind at the moment is, man, I have put myself in a terrible, terrible situation because if the wrong person happened to be riding by, or if the wrong person happened to see that, what rumors that are going to be started? That's my story with a prostitute. Now let's look at this. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. The scripture says, Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. A woman who had lived a life in that Eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair and she kissed them. And she poured perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now, all indications from our text, uh, from Luke's commentary of it to the Pharisees' accusation against this lady, it, it tends to back up that the, the, the speculation that most every scholar I've ever read a commentary from uh, believes is that this woman in our text was a, a prostitute. Now, with that in mind, think about how intimate this prostitute became with Jesus. Here he is at the house of a Pharisee. They're having a banquet. And, and we're actually going to come back to this text next week and, and get a little bit more into detail with this. But uh, d just for now, the table that Jesus would have been sitting at was somewhere around 18 inches high. He would have been sitting on a cushion and leaned up against, propped up against the table with, his, with one arm and then eating with the other while his feet were kind of kicked out behind him. And everybody that was at the table would have been sitting that way. But there were crowds that were packed in the Pharisee's house and in the courtyard that, that they would have been eating at, listening as Jesus taught, as Jesus preached the gospel. Well, this, this, this prostitute had found her way in amongst this crowd and was standing right there at Jesus' feet as he taught, as he preached. And as Jesus preached, she became convicted of her sin. 
She became convicted of the lifestyle that, that she had been living. And she couldn't hold it back anymore. She just began to cry. She began to weep. And the tears started streaming down her face. And, and they, they from her face and they started to cover Jesus' feet. Then this prostitute gets down on her knees. And she gets down and she takes down her hair. And she begins to wipe Jesus' feet with her hair. Wash Jesus' feet with, with her hair. Now that doesn't mean anything to us in our society but for a woman to be seen in public with her hair undone it was an act of the utmost immodesty i mean it was a completely immodest act she didn't care about modesty she took her hair down and she was washing jesus's feet with her tears and with her hair when she got done doing that the scripture tells us that she began to kiss jesus's feet then she pulled out an alabaster jar of perfume, very expensive. And she poured it on his feet and she anointed him with that expensive perfume. I, when we read this, I think we miss how awkward and how intimate this situation would have seemed to everybody else in the room. We're 2,000 years later and we know Jesus' character. But imagine how intimate and even scandalous this must have seemed. Ladies, let me ask you this. If your husband, take Jesus out of this scene, put your husband there as he's the one at this table, and have a prostitute come in and very publicly do all the things that this prostitute had done to your husband, weeping over his feet, taking her hair down and rubbing his feet with her hair, then kissing his feet, then anointing his feet with some oil. Can you see how this would have, how this would have been? I'm looking at some of the faces of you ladies and I can tell that you understand how important. We're 2,000 years later than this event and some of your husbands are in trouble right now just because I brought you looking at him like, mm-hmm. Shouldn't have done that. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what was going through the people's minds? And yet here we see Simon. We see this, this Pharisee. His reaction to what's going on. Verse 39. So if this prophet. He would know what kind of woman this is. He would know what kind of sinful woman this, 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 this lady is. What she's done. I was reading this a few months ago. And. I've read this a hundred times before, but something just seemed odd about it at that time. And I kept going back and I kept reading that verse 39. It was something odd about what the Pharisee, what Simon had said. And I kept going back and, and, and reading it and reading it. And finally it dawned on me. This Pharisee hated Jesus. He was trying to find some way of, of setting Jesus up and accusing him and discrediting him. And here we, we've got his thoughts. He doesn't even say this out loud. He's just thinking it. He says, if this man were a prophet, he never calls Jesus' character into question, even in his mind. Instead, the only thing that he calls into question are his credentials. If he was a prophet, if he was qualified to be a prophet. But he never, he never, he never calls Jesus' character into question. Now again, take Jesus out of this story and put in us there and what would people have questioned it wouldn't have been our credentials they wouldn't have said mm, is, is that guy qualified to be a preacher is, is that guy qualified to be a mechanic is that guy qualified to be a farmer nobody it would have never no one would have ever qu uh, questioned our credentials instead they would have questioned our character they would have looked at that lady known her past known what she did for a living Seen how intimate in that setting she was with Jesus and, and just this outpouring. And they would have started to make some assumptions. Uh-huh. There's Chris. Uh-huh. There's Joe. Uh-huh. There's Jim. Uh-huh. There's Fred. Whoever it happens to be, they're going to say, uh-huh. There's that person. It looks like him and her have something going on. It looks like they have, it looks like they have some type of past together. But Jesus' character is never called into question, even by his enemy, even in his mind. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 tells us how impeccable the character of our Lord is. It says that he was tempted in every single way that we are, 
yet he never sinned. This Pharisee knew Jesus. He had seen him live his life for a couple of years at this point and had never seen any character flaw in him whatsoever. You know, as a Christian, we've got to understand that we are called to live by that same moral standard that Jesus set for us. Now, I know this is not popular to preach. It's not popular. Like, we just kind of gloss over this stuff and get on to grace. How God's forgiven us. We've got grace. And, and that's where we want to stay right there. Let me tell you about the reality of what Scripture tells us to do, though. We, we can't ignore these facts. We're called to live by the same moral standards that Jesus lived. Listen to what he says. He's preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and in Matthew 5, 48, Be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect. That's the standard that he's called us to live by. Over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, he says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may, they may witness your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he, that he visits. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, John tells us the very reason that he's writing his letter to the church is so that they will not sin. Now, you read those verses, and it's impossible to come away with any other conclusion that, that God, he expects us to do these things, to be perfect, to be good, to, to not sin. That's the moral goal that Jesus has set for us. That's the moral goal that the Bible has set for us all the way back from Genesis, all the way through to the end of Revelation. But mercy, do we ever mess that thing up? He says, here's your goal is perfection, but then we come along and we mess it up. That first John passage, I, I, I want to keep reading that for just a second. And, and look at where he goes with this. First John 2, 1. He says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. That's our goal. But then he talks about our reality. He says, but if anybody does sin, I relate to that. All right, here's our goal. But we fall short of it. We fall short of it every day. We fall short of it all the time. In fact, you go back to 1 John chapter 1 and he says, look, if you don't think you're falling short of it, you're just a liar and the truth, the truth is not in you because you've deceived yourself if you say that you're without sin. Thankfully, he tells us a solution from falling from our goal to our reality as we continue reading. He says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin... We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. I love that description of Jesus. The people in our text for this morning asked the question after Jesus had forgiven this prostitute. They asked the question, who is this? John gives us the answer. The Pharisee, whether he wanted to or not, he gave us the answer. The way we live our lives in, compar in comparison to Jesus, we're given that answer every day. Who is Jesus? He's the righteous one. He's the holy one. He is the one who has never sinned at all. And when we go back and we look at that Old Testament comparison that, that it, it may, is made between us and God, between us and our Savior Jesus, we're told that our righteousness... As the, the best that we can muster up as individuals is nothing but filthy rags when we compare it to him. Who is Jesus? He's the righteous one. And he's the one that desires to come and save us when we drop the ball. He sets this goal for us and even though we sin and we fall short of it, he comes and he gives us a solution to our problem of sin by, by raising us up through his blood, by covering us with his righteousness. And let me tell you something, that gives me a peace. And that gives me a, a, a comfort in my mind and in my soul to know that one day when I stand before God on judgment day, that I will not be judged based upon my own lack of righteousness, but upon Jesus's righteousness. Man, that's good stuff. We're going to be judged based on Jesus's because we're covered in his blood. We're clothed with him. Let me tell you something. If you don't have that, if you don't have that hope, I ask that you get it today. Jesus asks that you get it today, that you make that good confession that he is the Christ, that he is the son of the living God, that you repent of your sins, that, that you're willing to con confess it before man, that you're willing to be baptized into his name, to have all your washed away and to get that, that precious gift 
of eternal life, get that precious offer uh, of salvation that he's given, where you stand before his Father one day and be judged not on your own righteousness, but upon his. Would you stand and pray with me? Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you that we can see from our text this morning and, and just so many other passages of Scripture that he is the righteous one. Lord, you take him out of the him out of that picture and put any one of us in there and it's a scandal but because of his character because of who he is because he is righteous lord that was never even called into question lord with us it would be rumors would have got started scandals would have would have gone on because we do sin and we fall short of of your glory all the time father we pray that you would forgive us I just pray that if anyone is here this morning and has not accepted your son, Jesus, as Lord and Savior, that today will be the day that they come and get that right with you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Gold Point family and Junior Church kids. I'm so excited to bring you another lesson on this theme of fundamentals of our faith. As we get started, we're going to play the same game we did before. We're going to have a zoomed in picture. You're going to guess what it is. And, uh, and then we're going to zoom out and see exactly what the picture was. The theme this week is more or less a particular place. It's going to help us when you first see the first picture. So here we go. You ready? Here goes the zoom in picture. What do you believe this is? What do you believe this is? You got two main things in this picture. Um, I don't want to give too many hints on this particular one, but the one hint was... That it's a theme of this area, like a a specific area. Well, if you guess the beach, you're exactly right. One of my favorite places, or probably my favorite place to be able to go, uh, to just hang out for a little while and a vacation, it is the beach. And so, uh, good job if 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 y'all guessed that one right. Here's your second one. Remember, the theme is beach. The theme is that area. You ready? Here's the second one. What do you believe this is? Um, you got some clues there with, with blue, that could be something, and then the different colors, and, and then the green at the bottom. What do, you, what do you believe this is? If you guessed, if you guessed a, uh, a lighthouse, you're exactly right. Great job if you guessed a lighthouse. Here's the, here's the third one. The third one uh, is one of my favorites. Oh my goodness. Um, what do you believe this is? Mm. This is so good. That's your hint. This is so good. And you probably already guessed it. And you're exactly right. If you guess crab legs, you are exactly right. Those are one of my favorite foods. Mm, so good. And so we we saw the zoomed out picture and then we see the other. And if you got them all right, awesome, awesome job. This week, this theme of uh, that we're going to have this week is, is prayer. It, it's praying. I know that before we've talked about prayer and how we should pray and and what we should pray for and and all these different things. This week, we're going to look at the theme of prayer in the sense of different people in the Bible who prayed. We're going to look at their situation, look at what what they're praying for, what they're praying maybe even against, but praying uh, and how God sees their prayer and either answers and and answers it. And we're going to see different, different ways that he answers it. And so at the very beginning, we see 1 Samuel 1, 9 through 11. In this passage, there's this woman named Hannah. Hannah's been waiting and, and, and waiting and praying for, for a child, um, waiting for, for God to give her this blessing of a child. And it says this in verse 9. Once when they were finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now, Eli, the priest, was sitting in a chair by the doorstep of the Lord's house. It says, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. Now, now know know that some things in this passage where it talks about that she's in deep anguish, that she weeps bitterly. It's showing an expression how much she does want this particular thing that she's praying about. She's actually praying for a child. That it's not something that just comes and says, God, I wish I had so and such. But she's been praying for this and wanting this, the anguish of her, uh, of deep emotion, but also the weeping bitterly. And she said, and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look at your servant's misery, talking about her and her, and her situation, her situation that she's in personally. 
And it says, and remember me, and do not forget your servant, and give her a son, speaking for herself. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. No razor will ever be used on his head. Do you see the context of what she's being able to do? She is so in, and in, 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 as another word, misery, anguish, these, these, these different words to express of what she really wants. She really wants a child. She's begging in, in, eager, um, in, in eagerness of being able to want this child. And I'm going to tell you that there are some times when God will answer, God's going to answer your prayer regardless, but he's going to answer it with a yes with a, this may be something later down the road, or sometimes he answers it with a no. There are some times when we ask God for things, and as we ask him for things, um, sometimes he'll say no. But here's the biggest thing that we got to remember, that we want what God wants. And if we pray for something and God doesn't, doesn't give it to us, we got to remember that that's not what God wants us to have, or wants us to be able to do. And so we just got to continue to remember that we want what God wants. And so in this passage, we see that Hannah wants a child and she's even going to going to give him to God as a as a as a as a blessing to her to to him just as much as it is to her. The sec, the second story we're going to look at is in Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. As we look, they're trying to find something to get to get Daniel against, to get him uh, to find uh, troubles in him, find something going on with him. And it starts in verse 7. It says, the royal ambassadors, the prefix, the, the satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed. Okay, so, so all these people have agreed that the, the king should issue an edict. Okay, to and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next thirty days, except to you, speaking to the king, your ma your ma uh, majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. They're trying to find a way to get Daniel in trouble. They're trying to find a way to get him uh, in, in a in a bad position. And so then they told the king, "Hey, look." You should make basically a decree to say, look, you can't pray to anybody else except to the, uh, to the king. And so check out what Daniel does. In verse 10, now Daniel learned that the decree had been published, meaning that they wrote this down. Nothing could go against it. And it says, and he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. And it says three times a day. He got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Do you, do you see, do you see what, what Daniel's doing? Do you see what they tried to do to Daniel? They're trying to put a decree to say, hey, you can't pray to anybody else except to the king. And Daniel's like, you're not going to stop me. And he's going to pray to God regardless of what this decree says or not. Well, these people found out, and as they found out, check out what happens. In verse 16, it says, so the king gave order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve, continue, rescue you. Do you see what he says? Do you see what the king says? The king says, your God, not, not, not our God, not my God, your God, specifically to you, Daniel, your God. And it says, whom you serve, right? He says, rescue you. And so Daniel was put into the lion's den because he was praying to God. And so as, as y'all probably already know about this story, in verse 21, so the king came early that morning. He wanted to see what was left of Daniel. And Daniel answered, may the king live forever. Now he's not talking about that king that was standing right there in front of him. He's talking about God. He says, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of lions. They have not hurt me because I am found innocent in his sight, God's sight. And not only God's sight, but nor have I ever done any wrong before you. Speaking to the king, your majesty. I can almost see that as being like a, a sarcastic, 
I ain't done nothing wrong. And God saw that, and you know that. And so it's so cool to be able to see how God, or how Daniel stood up to the king and to these other people and worshiped and prayed to God. The last one that we're going to look at this morning is Matthew 26, 36, and 39. So this is after Jesus has eat, uh, been up in the upper room and, and had uh, the last supper with his disciples. And he's leaving there, and, and he says this. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he says this, going a little further, he fell to his face to the ground and he prayed this prayer. He said, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So we saw with Hannah that she, uh, got, she uh, was blessed with a child and here we see that, that God basically tells Jesus this is the only way. Now, now this hurts God just as much as this is going to hurt uh, Jesus going to the cross. And it says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Like, like I, I don't want to go through with this. I, I don't want this. It says, but not as I will, as our, my physical self, but as you will, God, my father. And so Jesus prays this, he goes back and he sees his disciples asleep and then he comes back and he prays this prayer again. You see, so we have Hannah who was, who was blessed with a child. We have Daniel who was in a tough position but still prayed to God. And we have Jesus who was in a tough position about to die on the cross and he says, if there's any other way for this to happen, I would rather that happen. But there wasn't. And so we see that Jesus had to go to the cross. And so this week, we've learned a, a few things. One, God will answer our prayer. And it may not be the way we expect Him to answer. It may not be the way we want Him to, uh, to answer our prayer. But God will answer our prayers. Number two, regardless of what, uh, what it is, we all need to pray. And, and Daniel's situation of, of the circumstances where he wasn't supposed to pray to God, only to the king, um, he, he prayed to God anyways. And so even if people say not to pray, we still need to pray. We still need to pray, even if people tell us not to. And number four, when we have big decisions, Jesus had that big decision of going to the cross. When we have big decisions in life, maybe you have a test coming up. Maybe, you know, maybe be praying for the tough decisions that are happening in this world uh, and with the governors and with, and with the president. And just all these different people that we need to pray, with, pray for them as they make big decisions. We all need to pray. This week, the goal is this. Every day, every day, I want you to pray at least five times a day. I want you to pray five times a day. And I don't want you just to pray for morning, night, and for your, for your uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's not, what, that's not only what I want you to pray for. I want you to pray for other things, even if it's at those times. Like at least five times a day. But I want you to pray continuously. I want you to pray more than five times a day. But when you do pray, I want you to mention other things other than just your food. Guys, we need to make sure that we take time 